Hello, today we're currently looking at quite the mess, quite the mess indeed. There's a lot of projects going on right now. This is this weekend's video on the, on the yeah, look, I'm no computer, it's uh, stereo Leslie speakers. Hopefully I'll have them sorted in time. I had a little bit of an accident and I broke something. I'm waiting for the replacement to turn up and then that video will be up. But in the meantime, I figured let's build something else, shall we? So we have right here this is what we call a bell sequencer, bell programmer. It's called the Synchronome from Woodside Place, Alberton, Middlesex. And uh, this uh, machine is pretty cool. Uh, what it was is it was made to program bells, bells to go off uh, in be it, I don't know, like a factory or a, or a school or something. It's truly a fascinating machine and we're going to have a little closer look right now at all of the bits and we're going to see what we can do and what has been done because so you'll realise now that in order to uh, get something interesting from it without modifying it, which I really don't want to, um, it might be a little bit tough, but it's sort of doable, I think. So the Synchronome, this one in particular, is a 1950s-ish uh, one. In fact, the serial number does say 1645, so maybe that means it's 945, potentially. I don't know. Let me know if that's right or wrong, but as far as I know, this is a 1950s design. You can find out a lot about it on the internet. There's a lot of information on these things since I found out. And I've had this for a couple of weeks now, two or three, and it comes with a lovely, lovely box. Look at that. Funnily enough, when it turned up, I was expecting it to be about this big, this big, and then it turns up and it's, it's massive. I'd say it's about, I'd say it's about 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters. So there's a good, it's a good chunky size. It is, it is rather pretty ginormous. The uh, lock on the front has sadly, uh, it's not there anymore. We've got, we've got no lock. We've got no lock on the front. So that's, that's one thing that's gone, but the rest of it, it's not original. Uh, if you look right here, this is a modification that was put in there and uh, it doesn't work. What it is, is there's a motor what it is is there's a motor that spins this cam right here, the motor's underneath, and it runs extremely slowly, and it pushes this switch right here. It's a little bit loose. And what this does is this ends up uh, telling the thing to move its thing. It'll make it'll make a lot of sense soon, but there's a this is a really rubbish uh, idea, and I'll go through why that is the case. I did actually cover this uh, a couple of weeks ago on a Patreon vlog, and why I've decided to just completely omit this because it is absolutely naff. Though so originally something like this would have been plugged into something, as far as I know, called a master clock. A master clock is something that is pretty much a pendulum, an electromagnetic pendulum that bounces and recharges charges basically sets the master clock uh, for the whole building, uh, be it a train station, a factory, a school, uh, I don't know, whatever it is, and that would be sat somewhere reasonably secure. These uh, master clocks were plugged into clocks around the buildings, uh, punch in and punch out things in factories, bell programmers, this, that and the other. I am no specialist on this stuff, so if you have more examples of what the master clock would have been plugged into, then you can comment below. And as far as I know, the reason for these master clocks being wired into everything instead of just separate clocks everywhere was, number one, uh, syncing them up so everything's in sync, so everybody's playing to the same time and stuff like that. And also, uh, I heard yesterday for, from to stop people uh, messing around with clocks to sort of maybe finish it, Earlier. So let's say the master clock might be sat in the office and it would stop like a factory worker coming in and going chuk, 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 and be like, right, it's lunchtime, see you later. Because if, uh, especially this thing as well, this one can be tampered with, hence why it's actually got a lock on it because then it stops it from being tampered with and we can see what it is like in a second. So with that in mind, this has been modified. It didn't have this. This is acting like a master clock in this situation. It's not 100% accurate, I found. So I think this might have actually been from a display of some sort of museum, possibly. And then what they did is they added this modification after. And uh, what this motor does is it basically just tells the clock to clock. This pretends to be the master clock. The problem is, is it's designed in a really rubbish way that 
I don't understand why they did it like, but we'll talk about it in a second. Over here is uh, another aspect to it. This is where you plug in the mains and you can also plug out to the bells because this is a bell program. It's for programming bells. You know, like ding -a -ding -a -ding -a -ding -a -ding so uh, yeah, now we look at this part. So what we have is this massive disc underneath. So this large disc at the bottom has the numbers and this is a 24 hour clock pretty much. This spins around and goes throughout the whole day. In fact, if you look at this side, uh, these numbers are on black uh, and these are on the actual kind of outside. This uh, kind of means it's, it's the day and this part, this side, means it's the night. So uh, these little pins right here on this rotating disc, uh, these are removable, and these are actually the programmable aspects to it. So it's sort of like, oh God, I dropped it. It's sort of like a, um, sort of like a sequencer in a way, but it's really slow and I've dropped, I've dropped the damn thing. So, so this is a little tool that it comes with, and all this does is you, you kind of pop the uh, pin in that you want to adjust the time on, and then you kind of, twist it into the hole you want and shablammy you've got yourself a time where the bell is going to go off. So how does the bell go off? Well let's have a look at that now. So we're going to have a look at this little switch right here. What this does is as one of the pins go past you can see it actually lifts up and this causes the switch to uh, break. You see that it just went up and down so that means that it removes itself from the connection. So this switch is pretty much telling the bell when to bell. So as this spins around, this is getting pushed to say, be a bell. But the thing is, is this is wired up in a sort of AND gate, a weird AND gate in series over to this switch as well. Look at that. And if you look here, you can see that there's a big bit of, um, of uh, brass around here. Is it brass? I'm pretty sure, I don't know. But um, this is connected, so all of the weekdays are hardwired for this. And then the Saturday and the Sunday, well, that means when this goes over the Saturday and the Sunday, which I can't do right now, it's a quite a twist, is this will close, this switch will close, which means that in a roundabout way, if this is triggering on a Saturday or a Sunday, well, the bells won't go off because this switch has, um, yeah, closed the loop. How crazy is that? But that isn't all that these are actually connected to. Well, 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 well. It gets a little bit more tech. So this thing, it only generally gets a pulse every uh, minute. It might be on 30 seconds, off 30 seconds. I'm not 100% sure what exactly the pulse is. But what the pulse is, is it comes from the master clock. It goes woo, 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 into these uh, two coils right here. What that does is that pushes this ratchet mechanism. Oh, you've got to really give it a and it makes that go forwards. So every minute, every minute you are pushing it along. I'm actually doing it with my hand now, but that's that's for a minute, it sends a pulse over to this. But the problem this poses is if this only receives a pulse every minute, that means this can be open for a whole minute, which means that the bell might be belling for a whole minute and you know you've been to places you know the bell doesn't bell for a minute that's not that's just that's just not happening so how do they make the bell only bell for a few seconds every minute well that's where this crazy setup right here comes in so uh, do you remember from the Hooting Owl video that I did on this uh, YouTube channel about making the Hooting Owl for the museum, which was a owl sequencer made from uh, multi-vibrator transistor oscillator circuits? Well, in that, it's said to use something, one of these things. Uh, what is this? Well, this is a mercury switch. Get in focus now. So what is a mercury switch? Well, basically, it's a bunch of mercury in there. You can see there's a bunch of liquid mercury that when it goes and connects between these two, it actually makes a connection. And there's a bit in the video where I show that happening. Well, this bell programmer has two mercury switches wired in series. Uh, they're actually two different mercury switches. And what these do is they actually mean that you're able to make the bell just ring for a little bit of time. Uh, you'll see that they actually uh, move around over a five minute cycle. So if I move this, every five minutes, this uh, top one, uh, actually uh, goes down and it flicks straight back over there. But this top mercury switch is actually pretty crazy. So inside of this one, I'm gonna remove it carefully, try not to break it. So this mercury switch is what is called a slow to 
break fast to make, or it could be the other way around. I think it is slow to break. And what this is, is a really over-engineered marvel. So if you look in there, you'll see there's a little uh, glass tube inside there, but there's also this thin bit of tube right there. What happens is the mercury pours over really quickly and it makes the connection between these two wires. But if you pour it the other way, it goes back really slowly, like a dial. Like That's because uh, when you pour it this way, it goes through that wide center tube in there, so it pulls through, glug, glug, glug. And then when you tear it over, it can't get through that tube, it goes through this bottom one, slower. And this takes approximately eight seconds for it to break. If you see, for the uh, for the connection to uh, be broken, and that means that the bell will ring for about eight seconds, thanks to this mercury switch, which is which is mad. Obviously, it doesn't work uh, when it's facing this way. Right now, we've got it all laying on its back, and it usually it's meant to be sat upright and be mounted on the wall, so it's not going to fully work quite yet. So, with all of this in mind, I figured I needed to make some sort of interface for this. I don't currently have a master clock or anything like that, and I didn't really. I wanted to make it a bit interactive, so I decided to actually build a sort of adjustable interactive master clock that is directly made for this uh, machine. And that's what we have here. This is uh, gonna be mounted below it and it's gonna be a uh, interactive thing. What this button right here does is you push it and it makes uh, basically sends uh, voltage to the coil to make the ratchet flick over. Uh, also, it's got a speed control so you can adjust the speed of the ratchet anywhere between a minute, which is the right amount, uh, up to I think it's like one every five seconds. And then it's got a trigger input so you can also wire in something to sync it up so you can bypass this and send in a synthesizer uh, and it's also got a max speed choke so it doesn't let it go crazy quick but it can get reasonably quick and then it's got the output which is the output that would initially originally be the bell and at some point we'll build a bell uh, interface to wire into this so we can trigger a bell anyway. On the inside, all it is is an Arduino uh, that's triggering a relay. I could have made it with a different circuit, but I just had an Arduino sitting there and I didn't know exactly what I wanted it to do. So I figured put an Arduino in there and then I can figure it out a little bit later. So it's got an Arduino going into a transistor, which is sending the relay. And then that sends the voltage into the coils up above in the actual uh, bell sequencer programmer finger majiggy. Right, so let's turn it on. So right now, it's going reasonably slow, but we can speed it up. The thing is, is yes, it will wear out a little bit quicker, uh, but if this is only on for a few hours on every Sunday, well, it'll end up, it's all right, it'll be okay, because this is, the max speed is about that, which yes, it is quicker than a minute, but you know, it's, it's only gonna ever do that for, you know, a numerous amounts of time here and there. So I don't think the wear and tear is gonna be uh, accelerated particularly. Also, it's it's going to be well oiled and stuff, but as you can see, and I can also, oh, if you really want to. So yes, this is basically a really, really, really long form trigger sequencer, if you think about it that way. Uh, I've only got a few of these pins annoyingly. I was hoping to find a few more. So if anybody has, uh, anybody knows where we can get some of these, they're a bit strange. They've got, uh, they got a thread on one side and then they're a pin on the other side. Maybe there's a replacement and I just don't know where to find them. Um, or they could be fashioned. I mean, they, yeah. Maybe I could just use bolts. I haven't actually looked into it yet, but if anybody's got some ideas, please suggest below what should be. But anyway, let's just uh, sit and watch it.
So uh, Dave Never Squirrel was around earlier today and funnily enough by pure chance we were looking through uh, this specific uh, telecommunications instruction manual. Uh, it is the, I think it's E to F. Uh, also this is worth mentioning, we're going to look at in a video coming up Martin King's father's engineering training school books because they were sitting around, Martin bought them around with the Stradra switch, they're absolutely incredible, we'll have a little peek at this. But in here uh, Dave was having a look through and whilst I was fiddling around with the uh, Bell programmer earlier, by pure chance he managed to get onto this page right here in the maintenance for the power section uh, at for the maintenance of power sections in telecommunications power sections like the you know the mercury rectifiers over to the batteries and all that stuff in in telephone exchanges and stuff and madly and crazily enough uh, yeah they have a bunch of different types of mercury switches in here and I couldn't help but notice this one right here the slow to make quick to break Mercury switch, and that is the one that we have in this, uh, well it's pretty much, I think it's actually the other way around, it's uh, quick to make, slow to break, yeah, yeah, that's the one that I have. So if you can see, there's a little drawing of the uh, central uh, tube that lets it go through it, let it exit the reservoir quickly and then go back in very slowly. Uh, amazingly enough, there's a load of different types of it. There's um, make or break. Uh, there's this one, which is slow to make, slow to break. As you can see, there's two, there's two different types of tubes going between two reservoirs, which make it slow to move either way, which is really cool. And if you look at from the front, it looks like there's connections going either side. It looks absolutely mad, actually. What's this one? Make before break. Wow. And um, change over. Oh yes, yeah, so there's a central pin and there's two that changes over. And then, yeah, another changeover type like this. Quite insane, but then yeah, you flick over to this, you get a closer image of where a, um, yeah, mountain tube for mercury. And this would have been, apparently, uh, is in the brake position pointed. It doesn't explain massively exactly where the application for this was, but apparently, I've heard, apparently it's been mentioned that uh, they're in for changeovers of batteries and stuff like that, and alarms and such, but, yeah, uh, I just thought it was an interesting thing to point out, but yeah, very interesting. Oh look, parking, vehicles, waiting on roadway. Uh, there's even bits in this like waiting where, part it, waiting where parking meter exists. Parking meters are brought into service under authority of legal orders based on agreed form. The orders include a paragraph on the following lines. That is funny, like you even, like this manual's got everything. We'll have a look through these ones uh, at some point in the video. Also, incredibly enough about the uh, Mercury switches and stuff like, it's quite amazing that l a large number of like thermostats in houses still have these thingies just sitting about, chilling in there. So, if you're living in a reasonably old house, go and have a peek. You might find yourself a Mercury switch. Bit of a surprise. How cool is that? So the other thing we haven't spoke about is like the regulations around mercury. And it's got, I gotta be honest, it's something I probably wouldn't even, uh, you know, think about or look at because it's only a couple of mercury switches, but it's a museum, so I've got to sort of look at these things, which is, uh, it's the first time in my life I've actually sort of got to be slightly grown up about these things. And um, yeah, I was reading up on the regulations about mercury and um, machines with mercury inside them. And yeah, it was it's a little bit hazy and all over there, and I'm waiting in the comments to see if somebody actually knows any more about it than me. But I'm just gonna tell you what I have, um, What's the word? What I have got from what I've read is um, you cannot sell things with mercury. However, there is a paragraph that says uh, things that are older than 50 years old before 2007, so last, uh, what, like 1957's the oldest, well, it's excluded from that. So you can actually sell this. You could buy and sell this. So getting this off eBay was perfectly fine. Like the, the seller wasn't doing anything wrong. It probably, they didn't even know whether they would be doing anything wrong anyway. They probably didn't even know there were mercury switches, but yeah, so getting this is fine. It's like a classic car. It's like, I guess it goes on the same thing as hardly any of them about. It's okay as long as it's, you know, dealt with accordingly. Uh, this thing, uh, like, it moves around. It's out of sight. It's out of handle. This thing will be shut. How cool is that? It's got a little, it's got like a little uh, holder that opens up and stuff. Um, it seems perfectly safe with these. They're enclosed, they're not gonna get hit. The only time that something like this is gonna smash is A, it gets too much voltage running through it and there's a spike, which this isn't gonna happen, or B, it gets dropped or it gets smashed. The thing is, these are wired straight into the machine and uh, yeah, I'm just asking, 
What do you reckon? I can unscrew them, remove the mercury switches. That is doable without actually having to modify it in any permanent manner because they are removable and the wires are screwed in so you don't even need to unsolder them. And I can put a bridge to bridge over them. The only downside is then you remove the uh, gate to trigger effect that the two mercury switches are actually giving. And that is giving you a uh, sort of, you know, an eight second pulse to ring the bell. Without that, it's just gonna send a pulse uh, that is about five minutes long uh, if you were on uh, maximum speed. So in the comments below, what do you reckon? This is closed, the, the mercury switches are there, they're doing their things, they're completely out of sight. Would you remove them? Would you not remove them? Do you know more about the regulations than me and know that this is not allowed? Please let me know because as far as I know, it looks like they're allowed. So as part of the risk assessment, I do have sulfur powder. Anyway, back to some more light-hearted things. I've put some conduit that goes down to the controller. The controller hasn't got any labels on it at the minute. I'm gonna put the bonnet back up again just because I'm working on it. I wish I would leave the bonnet up, but that's one step a little bit too far because it, it doesn't really have protection at all then because right now this, this has got a little bit of like a wooden seal. Obviously, it's not perfect, but like, are they gonna smash? Like, houses have thermometers with these things in them. I'm pretty sure it's okay, but I would love to hear what you think about Right, so now let's turn it on. Uh, there's a little bit of a scraggy cable coming from the bottom. Uh, it will be sorted at some point, but here we go. It's doing its thing. We'll speed it up a tiny bit. I think I might actually get some uh, lights uh, shining in when this is closed, like put lights in the enclosure so you can see it illuminated. I think that'd be really cool. There are a couple of sequence pins about to turn up, so we'll have a look at the LED and see what happens. All right, so keep an eye on this. And that is what the sequence looks like. Uh, there's another one coming around in a second. Here we go, let's have a look in three, two, one. Oh, it's coming. Here we go. So yeah, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wire this output, I'm gonna build a bell to it, but we can also plug other things in this and we're gonna do it in another video because I'm working on another project with a slightly different bell sequencer design. So uh, this will come up in another video where we'll try to actually make it musical, but this one's obviously just looking at the mechanism itself. But, I think that's pretty cool. It's a little bit dark. So there we go, this thing is set up. Obviously I haven't really tried the actual sequencer yet. We'll figure it out and stuff. But if you want to see this, it will be up and running on the Sunday, this Sunday in fact, and tickets are, there's a few, there's about, I think there's a handful of tickets still available for this weekend's uh, like open day, which is Sunday. So if you want to see it, it may have mercury switches, it may not. Let's see what the comments say. Let's see if there's anybody who actually knows what they're talking about. And um, yeah, maybe, maybe I just need to plonk a chemical sign here. I'm not, we need to figure it out. Need to figure it out. Anyway, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, uh, then uh, yeah, just check out more of the videos, subscribe and stuff. If you want to support the museum and stuff and see more content and stuff like that, then please go and check out the Patreon because there's loads of extra things on there. And there's also PayPal and stuff like that. But if you want to actually come here, then there's plenty of time to come and check it out as well. So anyway, have a lovely time.